for Global Medical News Network, this is Miriam Tucker reporting from the 2010 Annual Conference on Antimicrobial Resistance. Dr. Kaplan, you, you spoke about this large increase in community-acquired MRSA infections. Why is this happening? Well, that's actually a very important question. We do know that among the community-acquired MRSA infections occurring in the United States, this one major clone called USA 300 is by far the dominant clone. So there's something special about this USA 300 clone that makes it so capable of spreading and causing these infections. What it is exactly, we really don't know. In our studies, about 3% of the community-acquired MRSA isolates that we see at Texas Children's Hospital are associated with severe invasive infections. With an abscess, certainly incision and drainage is the key to optimal therapy. I also want to say that when you do get purulent material, I think it's really critical to culture that material so that we know what's going on in the community, in your own community, in your own office setting, so you know how frequently these community-acquired MRSA isolates are being seen and what the current susceptibility patterns of these isolates are. So right now, virtually all of the community MRSA isolates are susceptible to trimethoprim, sulfamethoxazole, septra, or bactrim, as well as clindamycin. But unless we keep an eye on that, we won't know. So it's really critical to get these cultures. I think the clinician needs to be aware of the fact that if you're in a community where these community-acquired MRSA isolates make up about 10% or more of the overall staphylococcal isolates, that when a patient presents with a severe infection and staph aureus is among the pathogens that is being considered an etiologic agent, that an antibiotic that's targeting these community-acquired MRSA isolates should be included in the initial empiric treatment. For Global Medical News Network, this is Miriam Tucker reporting.